Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. I'm Thomas, the producer of this podcast. We are back, and we're back with a series I'm really excited about. Um, We're calling this series Pillars, and uh, we call it that because it's about the pillars of Christian faith. What do Christians believe? Uh, This isn't an apologetic series. We're not going to do a lot of uh, uh, defending exactly why we believe these things. That's a whole other series, a really interesting topic, and I'm sure we'll get there. Um, But this is going to be really clarifying exactly what do Christians believe. Now, you may be thinking, well, Christians believe a lot of different things. There's different interpretations, denominations, and that's true. But there are some things that are core to every Christian faith. There are some things that if you don't believe uh, uh, this thing then you're really just not a Christian anymore. And that's not a judgmental thing. It's just just by definition, you know, you can't not believe in God and be a Christian, right? So uh, uh, we're going to be talking about those core things, those things that are core to the Christian faith, the pillars uh, of Christian faith. We're going to really kind of explore those in a deeper way. We're going to define those, you know, get into the theology behind those. So really excited about this series. The first thing we're going to talk about, we're going to start from the top. We're going to talk about God. What do Christians believe about God? That's a big, it's a huge topic. Uh, uh, God is such a broad term, but we're really excited to, to dive into this. Kevin Harney is uh, is with us today. I'm actually hosting this one. So really excited to get into this conversation about what Christians believe about God. I hope you guys enjoy. Well, Kevin, thank you for uh, for coming back to the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for doing this. and. I'm really excited about this series. Uh, we were just talking before about the usefulness of this series. We're yeah. we're going to be talking about exactly what Christians believe. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily an apologetics podcast, mm-hmm. defending that and, and going into the depths. It's really a theology podcast, exactly what we believe. This is something I think will be useful for believers yep. in deepening. Maybe they they really have a passion for Jesus. They have a love for Jesus. But maybe they uh, don't have a deep understanding of the theology behind yeah. things that can get yeah. dense sometimes. So hopefully in this conversational format, yeah. they can really gain an understanding of that. This is also something where, you know, if you're talking to a friend about mm-hmm. uh, uh, your faith and, and what you believe, and maybe they're not a believer, yeah. uh, this is something you can point them to. Something where uh, it's not an apologetic, it's not defending exactly why we believe everything. It's just what we believe so we, yeah. they can have a clear understanding yeah of where we're coming from, and then that conversation can proceed better. So really excited about this. And uh, what better place to start in this kind of thing than talking about God? <laughs> just just a blanket statement, yeah. God. What do we believe about God? Um, and and that that really leads us into our first question. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a simple question, but it's, it's deceptively complex. Yeah. What do we mean when we say the word God? What does that mean when a Christian says God? Yeah. Well, I'll try to decomplexify it a little bit here. (laughs) So I would first start with kind of an umbrella concept uh, for listeners in terms of what you were talking about, theology. So you got this umbrella of theology, and then under theology are all these other ologies, Mm -hmm. uh, the study study of. And so you can have Christology, which uh, with a good ear, you go, oh, Chris Christ. Okay, that's the theology of Christ. Uh, what do we, you know, you could have pneumatology, which we get pneumatos, the, the theology of the, of the Holy Spirit. Harmatology, from a Greek word uh, that is uh, the theology of sin. Uh, yeah, so there's all these, but the one under theology, there's a topic of theology, and that's the, right. that's the belief of God. So we're we're really talking about a big. This entire podcast series will be theology, but under theology, one of the topics is theology, which is the doctrine of God. Right. So that's where we're starting here. So uh, when, when people say, "Well, I you know I believe in God," or "I don't believe in God," or "What do we mean by God?" Um, I think when when many people say, well, I believe in God, in many cases, they haven't, they haven't really thought it through. They just mean, I believe in a higher power. They, they, they would even have a hard time articulating it. I look at my my dad's journey uh, from my upbringing. I grew up in a non-believing home. And so I grew up with a dad who was, I think when I was younger, quite young, he would have said he's an atheist. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a theological worldview. It's, I don't believe God exists. The word's in it, theist. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you, you know, so he would have been an atheist, which is I am, I'm against the belief in God. I think he went from there to being an agnostic, which where he'd say, I don't know if you can be, can understand or know if there is a God. So an atheism is one theological worldview. Agnosticism is actually a theological worldview. It says there might be a God, there might not be a God. I don't think we can know. In my dad's journey, he went from there to becoming a theist. 
uh, which would say, and a theist is a person who believes that a God exists, mm -hmm. but we don't, even when they say I'm a theist, we don't know exactly what that means. Right. Because a theist who's a deist, right. <laughs> it sounds like a poem, a yep. theist who's a deist, or, 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 <laughs> a, or, or, or a, Dr. Seuss, a Dr. Seuss book, which we're yeah. not allowed to read anymore, apparently, so we're not <laughs> going to get into that. Some of them. That's, that's a different podcast. Yeah, only some Indeed of them. Indeed it is. Um, but but you, you can have a theist who's a deist who believes that there's a God, but that God is disconnected and not engaged with us. And so when you said it's, it's deceptively um, confusing and it mm -hmm. seems so simple, what is God? Well, God is a loving being. Yeah. Well, and so my dad's journey, he went from being an atheist to being an agnostic to being a theist to what I would call eventually a friendly theist. Right. And as time went on, curious about Christianity, which is a cer certain theological worldview, to then in the last month of his life becoming a Christian. And at that point, he would have become a monotheist who believes in one God. Right. As a Christian, uh, somebody who believes in one God who exists eternally in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but is one in being. And and, and then you, you can go to polytheists who believe in many gods, mm -hmm. um, tritheists, who it's easy to figure out, believe, right. would believe in three gods. Some people say, well, Christians are tritheists because you believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three different gods. We would say, no, one God in being, but three in persons. We'll, get into, we'll probably talk more about that yep, later. Yeah, absolutely. So... All that to say, yes, <laughs> um, you're absolutely right when, when you say, what do we mean when we say God? Mm -hmm. And then within all of those different kind of categories, uh, how you would define and explain what you believe by, by the term God is radically different. So if, for instance, if you, have, if you have a person who's a devout Mormon, they will use a lot of the same language that a Christian uses. Right. Same terms. But if you say, but what do you mean by that? Yeah. You find out that the language itself is the same words, but the meaning of what they what they what they are understanding when you say that word is radically different. So if you, if you say to a biblical Orthodox Christian, "What do you believe by God?" the term God, they they would get it. They would talk about a, a, an eternal being who is eternally God, unchanging. Immu the theologians would call it immutable, unchangeable. Uh, but a person who has you know Orthodox Mormon. Theology. I'm not saying Orthodox is being correct. I'm saying right. Orthodox to their belief system. Traditional, if they're yeah. true to Mormon belief, they would believe in a God who was at one time a human being who evolved into God. That's not what Christians believe when we say God. So, right. yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God. What do you mean? Oh, that. Oh, that. They're not yeah. the same. So, it's, I mean, I, it gets tricky. And I can go on for hours and hours on these things because yes. this is a uh, semantics. Even, is a, even though it's a tricky thing, yeah. Even as a pastor in my preaching and teaching, all the things, the theological things, they'll come through in the preaching. But a lot of it is the is the the rest of the iceberg below the water line. In a right. time like this, you give me the freedom to bring some of those above the water line, which I love doing. And uh, I live I live in this world in my head, but in my normal preaching, I'm talking to a broad audience, so I don't get into right. a lot of those. Things. So is, is that a yeah. good start? Are we, is That's that a great going? start. I, I, we can unpack from there. I mean, yeah. this will be about a 10 hour podcast, I think. No, yeah, I'm just yeah. kidding. Well, even, even in the podcast form, we'll have to, even if we have an hour, these topics are so complex. You know, we would, I think we'd both encourage our listeners to, to go in to more depth on their yeah. own, but, um, but we do get to dive a little deeper and you mentioned a lot of words there. Uh, uh, and we can unpack those. You you kind of already touched on this when, mm -hmm. when talking about your dad's journey. When yeah. he became a, a Christian, he became a monotheist. You said, and yeah. there's, and I think we can kind of dissect those words and and yeah. and uh, you know intuitively see what they mean. But as a Christian, um, so there's there's a broad spectrum of yeah. beliefs, of semantics, yeah. of of uh, people when they say God, even in different religions, even mm -hmm. theists, you yep. know, whether they're Muslims, Mormons, uh, mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses, yep. there's, there's, it's confusing. So as a Christian, yep. um, for the purposes of this conversation, f going forward, when yep. we say God, what are we talking about exactly? Yep. How yep. do we define yep. God? Yeah. And that's, and that's the question. And it's a great question. And it's a great question for listeners of this podcast to, to, to start to ask themselves and ask other people. Mm-hmm. Oh, so what do you what do you mean by that when you say that? And that that's really hard for some people. They're like, I, I just mean God. I just mean God. I yeah. said God. Can, isn't that good enough? Well, not not if you really want to have a deep conversation. Right. And so, it, from a Christian world view, world view, uh, we believe in a God uh, who is, and we can we'll, we'll talk. I'm sure more about the characteristics of God and his attributes, his qualities. But we believe in in a a, a singular being, one God. So we are you know, mono, you know, mm -hmm. mono, mono, one to yep. one, yep. monotheist, one God. Uh, we believe we believe in one God who exists eternally, 
but that God exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so and so that's one of those things that and that that's one of those concepts that can push beyond the the boundaries of our own understanding and our own minds. Right. When we do our math and we go, okay, one plus one plus one, it always equals three. Right. Uh, theologically, one plus one plus one, when it comes to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're three persons, but in being, they're one. So this is mm-hmm. why Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right. I and the Father are one. He's not just saying one in the sense of we're kind of like each other. He's saying what the, what the philosophers would call it in an ontological sense, in, in the core of being. Right. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in being, one God mm-hmm. who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, but and and so so Christians are Trinitarian. Uh, that's and people some people will say, well, that word's not in the Bible. And so well, there's lots of words that aren't in the Bible, but we have words to describe what the Bible teaches. Right. And, and many 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 places the Bible talks about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about how they're unified, how they're one. And so the word Christian uh, isn't in the Bible. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd and, say that's a helpful term. Yes, and and also internet is not in the Bible. <laughs> that but one's it, definitely but not it in still the Bible. exists. It's you true. Know? It's true. And for better or for worse, it's there, right? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and our, it's our, a whole other conversation. Exactly, exactly. And our, our list, you know, our listeners are listening through the internet, so there's lots of good stuff that come there. So lots of words aren't in the Bible, but again, those words are shorthand to help us communicate what we mean. So, right. so you know, for my purposes as a pastor, as a preacher, as a Christian, mm-hmm. when I talk about when I say I love God, I'm talking about this one eternal being. Unchangeable, unchangeable, immutable, who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in persons, one in being. And you can talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one have different ways that they interact with us and different ways that we experience God's intimacy through the through, through the persons of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm guessing you're going to do another podcast on the Son and on, on the Spirit. And so oh, yeah. we're, here, we're here on kind of God as, as, a, as a being. And, and I would encourage listeners uh, to go online and do a search for the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. Okay. These are the three, what are called the, the three ecumenical creeds. And when the term ecumenical there simply means that all Christians and all church bodies globally through time who hold to the Orthodox biblical Christian faith would say, yes, we agree on those things. Right. And so uh, the Apostles' Creed is the most familiar of the three and uh, is used in lots of different churches uh more more in mainline churches as a regular kind of recitation of the words of the apostles creed and there's right. some people that go oh i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and jesus christ is only son our lord and they go, oh yep. i know that one yep. uh, and then the nicene creed uh also trinitarian in its structure and the nicene creed is more used in more like a lutheran catholic episcopal mm-hmm. backgrounds and so if you started kind of quoting that there are people oh that's that's right. kind of the creed we used a lot. Yep. The Athanasian Creed is used by almost nobody in terms of reciting or quoting. Uh, it's be- a tongue twister. <laughs> be- because it's it's rep- it's repetitious, yeah. but it's really it's really focusing on two things: the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So it'll be like you know, as the Father is eternal, so the Son is eternal, so the Spirit is eternal. As the Father is this, the Son is, that, and it goes over, and so it's re- right. very, re- but it's, it's making the point: three in person, one in being. And then the Athanasian Creed also addresses the two natures of Christ, which I know will be an upcoming podcast as well. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and if, if somebody goes online to look for those, I would say you can just go to what the, if you put in Christian Reformed Church, mm-hmm. ec- ecumenical creeds, um, the Christian Reformed Church is a denomination that's been around for a long time and they are more creedal, they'll use those creeds. And and so that would be a quick way that you could get it without lots of commentary and arguments mm-hmm. or debates. Just here are the creeds right. available for your perusal kind of a thing. Right. And I mean, they've yeah. had the arguments and the debates. These are from church fathers, church history, where they've thought through these things deeply. Yeah. And these aren't in the Bible, but no. these are these are taking advantage of the resources of 2,000 years of church history where they yeah. have really, uh, I mean, they didn't just throw these together, right? Mm-hmm. These are These are... Meetings from all across, you know, yeah. the 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 world at that point. Yeah. Um. Really interesting stuff. Yeah. And they they come out of times that people were polarized. Yep. Um. Debating, arguing, and and in this way with other believers who are trying to get to the say, how do we say what we believe in a very simple, straightforward, clear manner? Pro- probably in most cases in the in the fewest words with the greatest clarity, so that it's memorable. Right, and so you know we don't hold the the, the creeds as gospel or as uh, as inspired like the Bible is, mm-hmm. but we hold them as a great effort throughout history, and they all come out of their own historical context to articulate with clarity 
and to keep people from fighting and be able to say, yes, oh yeah, that's we, that's where our point of agreement is. Right. Yeah. And that's yeah. what we mean. So they're sort of answering the same question we're asking. What do you mean by that? What, what do you mean when do you, you mean say when God? You say yeah. God. I believe and, in you know, God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, mm-hmm. born of the Holy, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, you know, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. I believe in the Spirit. You know, it's it's walking through. Yep. I believe, boom, 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 boom. Simple statement of faith. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's kind of the, the uh, it's a sort of academic view yeah. of God. It's mm-hmm. this very, we're defining his, his essence and the, the way he exists uh, in relation to us, um, or, or maybe not so much in relation to us, but going there in yeah. relation to us. Yeah. What are the qualities of God? Uh, as Christians, what do we believe? We kind of see what God is mm-hmm. through those creeds, but mm-hmm. who is God yeah. to a Christian? Yeah. Yeah, and and I'll, I'll begin with you know, the the Jewish people in the ancient Jewish world and in the in the current Jewish world, uh, and 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 the, the Jewish faith is monotheistic, mm-hmm. um, and so in Deuteronomy chapter six is uh, there's a prayer or a declaration called the Shema, which is just the first word here in the Hebrew, and um, and it says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, mm-hmm. and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength." Jesus is actually quoting that. People will usually at you know kind of attribute that to Jesus, right? Uh, but he's actually quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. Yep. And he's quoting from what, what Jews then and even today would multiple times a day kind of meditate on this prayer. Think about this, this declaration. And so, um, you know, so so even in that, um, right after that Shema, right after that declaration, there's this this call to walk through your day as a family with a, an awareness that God is present. Yep. Talk with your children as you walk down the road. I mean, there's right within that same biblical text um, is this reflection on having faith integrated and understanding the intimacy of God. And so when we say, what are God's qualities? Um, I preached, um, as we're doing this podcast, our last night of worship was on uh, God is the I am. Mm-hmm. And in in, uh, in Exodus chapter three, Moses is before the burning bush. And he says, what, you know, if you're going to send me God back to the back to Egypt, back to this place that I ran from because I kind of made some mistakes there and I messed up and it's a dangerous place and I'm going to deliver all the people. What name shall I give? And God says, I am the I am. Tell them I am sent me to you. Then Jesus in John chapter eight takes that name on himself and the religious leaders want to kill him because they realize exactly what he's saying. He's, he's, and so, and so this, this name I am, uh, when you get to God's qualities, I think it expresses two great concepts, again, theological words that capture a, a big me- meaning and message. One is that God is transcendent. He is the, I am the God who is eternal, who is over mm-hmm. all, who is sovereign, who is glorious and powerful. That's a quality of God is his sovereignty, his glory, his transcendence. Right. But also the I am is I am with you. I am near you. I am imminent, intimate, close, and personal. And for some people, they have a hard time. It's like, well, no, either God's out there, you know, and right. distant from me, or God's in here and my personal best buddy, and uh, and we have to walk that that balance of acknowledging that God is because God is so much bigger than our comprehension. God can Thankfully. be transcendent. <laughs> yeah, otherwise he probably, it wouldn't yeah. wouldn't qualify as God. Right. Uh, but but you know that God is both transcendent, glorious, powerful, sovereign, and ruler of all. And God is intimate, concerned, interested. Um, you know when when my wife. Uh, goes out shopping and she's oh I found this thing and there was only one on the rack and it's just the right size and and just I think that the Lord really blessed me and some people go are you kidding the God who's running the universe doesn't care about a blouse mm-hmm. or what you know whatever the the thing happens to be right. uh, but actually as Christians if He is the I am who is with us who covers us with His feathers uh, with protection like like was shared with us in our in our morning devotion here at Shoreline mm-hmm. Church you know in our huddle um, you know. Then, may, then, then maybe God does care about um, your life and and your your marriage and your friendships and your health. And then all of a sudden, you can talk to God in prayer because He cares about that stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, I sometimes I wonder if He cares more about the bigger things. You know, there's there, there's uh, you know world peace and people who are, I mean, there, there's massive things. Right. But I actually do believe that God in His transcendence rules over all, but God in His imminence cares. I think in some ways more than. Uh, more than we recognize. C.S. Lewis has a great, uh, a li- little, almost a poetic little statement. That I can't quote it word for word, but he basically talks about, you know, do we ask too much of God or too little of God? 
and he says, uh, he says, we're, we're like children playing at the seaside, making mud patties or sand patties along the seashore when we don't realize that infinite glory is at our disposal. And he says, it's not that we ask too much of God, we ask too little. God is ready to be part of every aspect of our lives. And, uh, C.S. Lewis says it much better than I do, <laughs> but but the point the point is is that that we can forget that God cares about the little things and the big things of life, and so uh, and and then and then you can start to you can start to kind of list through um, God's qualities. You know, we can talk about the philosophical qualities of God. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the kind of practical biblical ones. And so I don't know what you, what you want to dig into or where you want us to kind of wander from here. Yes, and yes. Let, yeah. Well, let's let's start with. Um, well, let's start with the philosophical quality yeah. of God, since we're kind of transitioning from that "what is God" statement. Yeah. Um, philosophically, yeah. What What are those qualities? Yeah. So philosophers love fancy words, and oh, yeah. uh, and so right. uh, and so you know the all all of the omnis, which mm -hmm. is kind of all big. You know, so you got you you've got God's omnipresence, and so God is everywhere all at the same time. We can't pull that off. We're not, that's not our, that's not our strong suit as human beings. Right. But God, God, God is omnipresent. He is not bound by, by space and time. Uh, God, God is omniscient. So he knows everything. And uh, I still remember one of my first, my first um, philosophy classes getting into these, you know, into the different things and, and some of the discussions that come out. So, so God is omnipotent, so which means mm -hmm. God is all, you know, po potent, powerful. So God is all powerful. And so then there's a whole discussion. Well, then, you know, that if God is all powerful, if God can do anything, can God make a round square? Mm -hmm. That was why I remember that was one of the discussions in a philosophy course, you know, about, about the nature of God. Right. Can God make a round square? And what we were taught is that's a tautology. That's a, that's a, that's a nonsense term because right. a square is a square, round is round. Right. And so you say, well, if God's not all powerful, you know, can God make a stone so heavy he can't lift it? Right. I've heard that one. You know, and it's like, well, that's... So, so, so philosophers would call that tautology. I would call it, it's just stupid. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're, you're not, you're not questioning the power of God and his omnipotence right. by saying he can't, you know, if he can't make a stone that's so big, he can't lift it. He right. either can't make the stone or he's not strong enough to lift it. Ha, gotcha. God's not right. all powerful. Well, no, there, there's just, there's just no such thing. That doesn't, that, that's yeah. not even reasonable. It's a paradox. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and, and it's, it's, it's nonsense language in the same right. way that you would say, can, well, can God make a can God make a round square? Right. Can well, you that, exist and not exist? Yeah. It's just like is God powerful if He can't yeah. make Himself not yeah. exist? Yeah. That's just yeah ridiculous. The, the deep theological response is that's not a thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a thing to make a square round. It's and, not a and thing. And it's not to a make... cop out. Yeah, it, it's no. it's literally. I mean, I mean, we can get into this probably later, but God yeah. is a God of order and creation, yeah. Yeah. and yeah, it would not make sense for Him yeah. to. He is. He is. He is kind of the author of order. Yeah. Yeah. And you're talking yeah. about just ridiculous, like not yeah. just ridiculous. That's that's stupid. But you're talking about chaos. You're yeah. talking yeah. about something yeah. that doesn't yeah. compute. So it's just yeah. not even a, yeah. a question. It, yeah, and and so so people try to. You know, and, and those are those are sort of uh, fun theological bar right. games and that yeah. kind of stuff and debate debate things. Exactly. But um, so 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 God is you know all powerful, all knowing, all present. Um, and those are theological terms and philosophical terms to describe what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those would be called, you know, sort of the classical philosophical um, qualities of God. But then you get into the, just the, the ones that we can more, that we can relate with because we can in some way, and, and we, you know, we are made in his image and we're called to become more and more, to live more and more in a way that honors him. So God is also loving and gracious mm -hmm. and merciful. And we go, oh, I, I get that better. I could, I I have moments that I'm loving right. and gracious. I'm not always. Um, God is perfectly loving, perfectly gracious, mm -hmm. perfect, perfectly merciful, um, compassionate. We can we can live into those in our in our better moments. Right. Uh, and then God is also just and holy, and and you know, perfectly just, perfectly holy. And again, we're called in the scriptures to be holy as the Lord our God is holy. In First Peter mm -hmm. chapter one. Uh, there's this exhortation, be holy therefore because the Lord your God is holy. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I'm supposed to strive for that, but there's not a day I come anywhere close right. to the holiness of God, but that's that's the aspiration. And so um, and so there's all kinds of attributes of God that are perfected in who he is. And as you read the scriptures, as you build a relationship with him, as you know him more, we can see those things. And there's some aspects of, of it almost seems like the attributes from our mindset almost seem to conflict with each other. So mm -hmm. if God is loving but God is also the perfect judge. Mm -hmm. 
you are a loving being is not going to judge anybody. And then you start to get, that's a whole other conversation, right? right? But, but all, all, if, if you read the scriptures, you see the different attributes of God. A great way to learn attributes of God is actually to do what we're doing in our nights of worship at Shoreline, look, learn the names of God. Right. Because the names of God actually teach us a lot about his character. In the ancient world, a name had such deep, rich meaning. And for us, it's like, oh, that's a cool name. We'll call you this. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that name. It, it's a family name. But in the ancient world, the names oftentimes, people's names were, were sort of a representation of their character, who they were. And so the names of God become things that show us kind of who yep. his attributes and qualities. Well, let me, let, let's hang on that last part a little bit. There's, there's a couple of questions I have, but I think I, we can kind of answer them with the same answer. You mentioned uh, holiness, and I'd kind of like you to define that, but also that God is, uh, is loving, but he's a, he's a judge. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm a, I'm, I'm a millennial child of the internet, right? And yes. there's, uh, there's a website called Reddit where it's where like memes are born. Yeah. But there's a popular video that'll often come up, up on Reddit mm-hmm. where a judge, it's a judge in a courtroom, mm-hmm. and there'll be a sentence and they're either they're either it's kind of a gotcha moment where they catch somebody d- that's just been lying and doing something mm-hmm. terrible, and they get th- people love these. Yeah. I mean, not just Christians; people love watching these judges just uh, uh, judge, right? They yeah. are it's justice, yeah. it's righteous, and you feel good about yourself. And they're but they're judging. You know, the, the person off there's often somebody that's unhappy in that situation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, God is. The perfect judge, he's yeah. holy. Uh, that gets a bad rap sometimes. Yeah. Dwell on that a little bit. How can God be loving and yeah. a judge? Yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's it's a great question and it's a great thing to ponder. And I think for most of us, from from a very practical standpoint, um, we would hope that if in our human relationships, so there are people who are. Um, who become judges. You know, mm-hmm. we, as a culture, we have people who are judges. They right. wear robes, they sit in courts. Uh, we would hope they would be love. You know, we wouldn't want them to be simply uh, just and uncompassionate and loving. We would actually want them. You know, so so what would our, what our heart, most people, their hearts and minds would say, if we have to have judges, I would want that judge not only to be just mm-hmm. and fair, yes, to maintain justice and fairness, but also to be loving and compassionate. Especially if I'm the one being judged, right? Uh, and so, <laughs> yes. um, and but but even if it's someone else, yeah. I think I think we would say so. We would hope that that would be that that that's how a judge could conduct themselves. What the Bible teaches, and what the Bible oftentimes doesn't do, is it doesn't try to take different characteristics or attributes of God and overly explain and justify how they fit together. Right. It says, you know, God is this, God is this, and then different accounts and stories bear that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to then do the the theological work and the exercise of figuring out how all that fits together. And so, um, it gets really it gets really tough for people if they look. Okay, God is a judge who does things like bring brings a flood on the earth. God is a judge who does things like in Matthew twenty five separates the sheep, sheep and goats and says to some, "Come to my eternal home," and then to others, "Away with you." Ah, so not just judging, like kind of making a little wise judgment, like judging right. eternal. Mm-hmm. That's where people start to kind of freak out and 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 go, okay, I don't like that idea. Uh, and so I'm just going to kind of kind of go right to the the, the toughest scenarios and say, you know, yeah. and, and just say, let you know, let you know, when people talk about that kind of judgment, um, we we might we might want that kind of judgment if it has to do with somebody else who is really really bad. Right. Um, but we may not want that kind of level of judgment upon ourselves. What the Bible teaches is that God is absolutely just, which no human judge is. Mm, right. Um, yeah, and if you want to get memes and, and, and you want to get things on film, get human judges who pass judgment on other people and don't live it out themselves or get right. caught doing the same There's thing. There's just right? as many of those videos yeah, exactly. out there. <laughs> and, we, and, we're, and we're seeing a slew of political ones where politicians are making rules and regulations that they don't seem compelled to follow themselves. And so that's, that's the human pathway, right? Mm-hmm. We, we can see and aspire to something, but none of us measures up. Right. Uh, the difference with God is God is perfectly just and perfectly fair, whether we see it or not or get it or not. Mm-hmm. What we're used to is judges who are frail and imperfect. And we sort of want to, we sort of in our minds, I think impose that on, well, God, God shouldn't be judging. Well, if you're, if you know all things, if you're omniscient, if you are perfectly just at all times, then you know when judgment needs to come. Right. When you know when you know when judge is justified. And if you're also loving, which the Bible teaches God is, then his judgment is both just 
and loving. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't perfectly comprehend that. And this this is one of the this is one of the I think the big tricks when it comes to theology, is there's a point where I look at the I look at the kind of the expanse of my ability to understand, mm-hmm. and and where the edges begin, and where it, where all of a sudden it kind of comes it's kind of off the page or off the periphery of my intellectual capacity. Where I say there I here's what I can understand, and now I'm in the realm of I don't understand. I mean I I I I, I get it. It's real. Mm-hmm. So like, how does a carburetor work? Right. Okay. In my understanding, that goes off the page. Right. <laughs> I, I'm I'm not a mechanic. I don't know how a car. I know they work because I've had cars with carburetors, and there's guys that fix them, and I've seen it. Right. I just don't. Know, I can't explain how it works. Right. I would say the vast majority of things in the world, for me personally, they fall off the page of my intellectual capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a handful of things I know a lot about, and right. I and I and I love those, and I know a lot because I love those, and I find them fascinating. Um, there's all kinds of things. So, so if you look at all the universe of knowledge, you know, my, my pathway maybe is this, this wide, you know, and, and then the vast majority of human knowledge, I don't, don't right. understand. Impossible. I don't know how electricity, I, I took a class. I know, I know a little bit, but I don't know when I flip the switch. I just know the light comes on. It works. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know what, Thomas, I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have, to, I don't have to be able to explain everything. Uh, now, it happens that for me, the issue of theology and faith is where the vast majority of my knowledge resides because right. that's my education, my my occupation, and the passion of my heart. Right. Um, and so I probably have a wider bandwidth. But even when it comes to that, how does God? How is God perfectly gracious and compassionate and loving? Perfectly, and yet at a point we'll say, "Enough, no more." I've given you every chance possible. You've refused, therefore judgment is coming. Mm-hmm. That's hard mm-hmm. on, a, on, a, on a heart level, on an existential, personal, emotional level. That's hard. But I also trust that I know enough of God's love and God's justice, and and that I can I can see in the heart and mind of God those things will make perfect sense. I don't believe there'll be any human being who is lost, who didn't have every chance in the world to be found. I, I believe that, that somehow yeah. the, the God in his grace uh, through through creation, through different ways, speaks to us. The, the Romans chapter one talks about that. Um, so God makes it possible for all to believe. People choose whether or not they want to respond. You know, Abraham came and lived, Abraham in the Old Testament lived long before Jesus did. Yep. But the Bible says Abraham believed and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Well, he never met Jesus, but he believed. Right. So, so, so there's things outside the periphery of my comprehension. Um, I don't try to go to that too quickly right. and go, it's a mystery, you yeah. know, for everything. So I, I'll sit and, you know, and so I, you know, I can go much deeper into the, into the, I actually, within the, what I can comprehend, can I comprehend a God who is perfectly loving, but also is so just and so wise that he knows when judgment is not only necessary, but right and perfect. Mm-hmm. I, I, I go, yeah. There's a little emotional part of me that's hard to think about judgment, but can I comprehend a God who is both loving and just? And I can't, and I think most people, if they're honest, yeah, they would want a human judge to be those things. So wouldn't they want the divine God of the universe, who's the only one who really has the right to judge? Right. You know, when, when Jesus... Uh, when Jesus was in the courtyard with this woman who's brought in and just in, in the in the middle of sin, and she's been caught in the act of sin, and he says to the people, the one of you that hasn't sinned, you throw the first stone. Mm-hmm. And it says one by one, they dropped the stones. They walked out of the courtyard, starting from the oldest to the youngest. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say they dropped the stones. I, that in my mind, I see that. I picture that. But it says right. one on one, they left the courtyard from the, from the oldest to the youngest. I think the oldest were the wisest and understood their own sin and mm-hmm. frailty. They left. What's left in the courtyard at this point, everyone's gone. It's Jesus who's drawing on the ground, the text mm-hmm. says, and this woman who's standing in judgment. And Jesus looks up at her and says, where are they, woman? Is there no one left to condemn you? She says, no one, Lord. Mm-hmm. And he says, then neither do I condemn you. Yeah, it's powerful. Go and leave your life of sin. I don't condemn you. Now knock it off. You know. Yeah. Um, and you go, okay, the only one at that moment who could have cast the stone was Jesus. Right. But I think he saw a redemptive moment and, and expressed mm-hmm. grace. That's the heart of God. And I think God gives redemptive moment after redemptive moment after redemptive moment. But there's a point where if we say, I do not receive that grace, I choose to live and walk away from that grace. Mm-hmm. I believe God in his justice says, then you will get what you choose. 
Yeah. And in a sense, you will get what you have earned and deserved because I offered to take all that on myself through my son and you refused it. So now you pay the price. Someone has to pay the price. And his justice again becomes clear. Right. And so that's, I, I, I hope for listeners that makes sense. That's, that's a very brief uh, breakdown of something that's extremely complex right. and very, uh, and a heart issue, not just a theological issue, it's a heart issue. Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah. and I mean, you can reference back to the his omnipotence and his mm-hmm. omnipresence when yeah. thinking about those things. And yeah. it's a whole nother topic to talk about faith. I know that in my journey, there was a point where a lot of the, it's a mystery, it, it, that felt, it, <laughs> it made me kind of mad. It's just like, that's a it, cop out. It, it probably felt like people weren't thinking hard enough exactly. to try to figure it out. Right, right. And it's 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 this easy kind of a throwaway. And, and right. that, so that, that irritates me too. Yeah. I, I don't go to that quickly. But, but there are certain areas. God is three in persons and one in being. I get enough to understand and embrace it. Do I fully understand it? No. Jesus right. is fully God and fully man. I believe that I embrace it. I, I can understand it enough, but there's a point at which you fill up the cup with full divinity and full humanity. It seems like half it's going to float. I don't know. I, yeah. My brain doesn't fully. So there's some, the really, really big, big, right. big God, God knows all things, and yet there's a measure of human freedom. Th- those are the, like, those are like the biggies. And on yep. those ones, I mean, I, I'm not embarrassed to say, I don't understand how carburetors work. I don't understand how electricity fully works. Um, I've been married 36 years. I don't fully understand how my wife works. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love her like crazy. I mean, I there's there's so much I don't fully comprehend yes. to sit in judgment over God right. and say, you have to function in a way that I perfectly understand and still be God. I look and go, that that seems pretty arrogant. Right. <laughs> and, so and it's I, not, it's not yeah. an unthoughtful... It's not the first reaction where like, well, I don't get it, so whatever. Yeah. It, it's yeah. through a deep reflection on this, yeah. there comes a point where you're, where you would expect if yeah. God is half of what we say he is, yeah. then there there would come a point where you hit a, a, a limit, but it's a thoughtful limit, and yeah. faith is a whole nother, uh, uh, you know, topic we could have yeah. in itself, yeah. and, and um, Kierkegaard is like my philosophical hero. <laughs> And so uh, his his kind of take on faith is is huge, and maybe we can get into that in a future yeah. podcast. But um, uh, that's a, and, that's the whole and, and thing. And the fun of, of Kierkegaard is deciding how you're going to pronounce his name. Yeah, get, Kierkegaard you're, technically. Yeah, exactly. I know, exactly. I know. It's, it's but you, you, it's, it's Ameri- like, Americanizing of it. It's like Lacroix. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's technically Lacroix. But nobody says Lacroix. They call it Lacroix. Lacroix. <laughs> that, <that's, laughs> and then you can pronounce it pro- wrongly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well. Uh, Kind of shifting here. Yeah, we, we, yeah. We've explored that. Obviously, like you said, there's so much more we can say, mm-hmm. and, and there's so many brilliant Christians over yeah. the years who have written on that. Um, but let, let's move to a new kind of um, yeah, uh, thing about God that often comes up, yeah. and it's the fact that we can't see him. You know, he's yeah. not Zeus on Mount yeah. Olympus, yeah. and yeah. Uh, this our God is, um, is not seemingly, you know, Jesus was a, we believe he was a physical person, yeah. but for us today, we can't see God. Yeah. Uh, why is that? What, what uh, is there a reasoning behind that? Yeah. And this has been, this has been a, a you know, point of consideration and discussion all through the history of the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in Jesus Christ, um, we have a perfect reflection of God in you know, Hebrews chapter one, uh, really gives us the, at the very beginning of it, gives us picture of he, he is the, the fullness of the substance of divinity, uh, in one in one uh, one theologian is the the effulgence, the, the the full nature of divinity. And so, in a sense, when you when you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. So that you go, okay, well, that's but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking right. about how how God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and this Trinitarian eternal being um, exists as Christians would say as the most real of all beings. Mm-hmm the most powerful, the most uh, tangible, the most present, and yet yeah. we, we can't see where is he? And And you don't want to go to the point where, uh, and we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, different, you know, atheism, monotheism, tritheism. Well, also there's pantheism. Mm-hmm. And pantheism is, uh, if you think of like Pan Am Airlines back then, it's like the, they're, they're the airlines that went everywhere. You know, pan, pantheism is God is everywhere. He is everywhere and in everything. And so it's not just saying that God is is omnipresent. Pantheism would say that God, that all things are God. Yeah. This is God. Right. This is God. This is God. And then you, and, well, then not just that God dwells in you, but you are. Yeah. And, and so that that that's not that's not biblical theology. 
Uh, and so you say, okay, well, if we can't see God, where is God? Well, God is God. Is, God is everything. No, is God everywhere? God, um, God's omnipresent. Yes, but we can't see Him. Now, what we can see are the results of what God does. So, just on a practical level, if I say to you, uh, I'm I'm going to go out and fly a kite today because mm-hmm. it's 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 really windy. It's a great day for kite flying. Yeah. Now, to be perfectly clear, I'm not heavily into. <laughs> Kiting. I don't know if kiting is a word. Really? But, oh um, man, you're missing out. But um, but on, on a nice breeze day, there are people who love to go out and, and fly a kite. <laughs> How do they know it's a good day to fly a kite? Well, because they see the results of the wind. Right. They see trees moving. They hear the wind. Mm-hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the the word the word for wind and the word for the spirit of God are the same. We we get pneumatics that kind of but but pneuma. Mm-hmm. So, so if you do if you do a podcast on the Holy Spirit, that's pneumatology. Yep. Um, and so, if you look and say, okay, well, and it's interesting. It's interesting that the word for the Spirit of God, the presence of God at work in our world right now, and the word for wind are the same word in the Greek language. It's kind yeah. of fascinating. But the idea that I can see God at work because I see the things that He does. I, I, you know, you can feel the wind on your face when you step outside. So, so I think that. In a sense, people. If somebody said the wind does not exist and is not real, mm-hmm. because you can't see it, yeah. or or to be a little bit more crass, if you have the winds, <laughs> okay, <laughs> which would be which would be a flatulence or gas, yeah. you'd say, well, I can't see it. But if you're in an elevator with somebody, you know it's there. You know it exists. Now, I don't know if this is this, this is exactly. Uh, so we've gone from the there's sublime. A theo- there's a theological metaphor there. It's powerful yeah, stuff. Exactly, it, it is powerful <laughs> stuff. And uh, you know, but but uh, we've got go from the sublime theologically to the. Uh, yes. But but the 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 point being, uh, whether it's wind blowing or the winds in an elevator, mm-hmm. you can know it's there without seeing it. Right. And there's lots of things, and and then you can go to things like, well, how do you know, Thomas? How do you know that Megan loves you? Right, you see, you know, because there, the, because love, okay, there it is. It's this thing here. I'm going to hand you five ounces of mm-hmm. love. Doesn't so this this I would I would say for me the way I grapple with that is there's a lot of things that I know are absolutely real. Right. Whether it's something like love, which is very different than wind, but but it's you know, or whether it's the wind blowing, I see the results of it. I see the reality mm-hmm. of it. And some of those things, uh, you know. Those kind of things are as real, or in many cases, seem more real than the tangible things we can see. Right. And Absolutely. so the other thing I would say is, in the throughout the Bible, there's there's what theologians would call a the- theophanies, and a theophany is a manifestation of a visual sighting of God that's not God, but it's the thing that God is doing. So when Moses is at the burning bush, mm-hmm. and he sees, and it says it says in Exodus three that the bush, the bush is burning and burning, but not consumed. So it's burning, but he can see the flames. I don't, I don't know if when he went close and he's told he could hear the voice of God, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. I don't know if he could feel the heat of the flames. It doesn't say that in the text, but he could see them. Yeah. But that's not God. That's a, that's a theophany. And right. again, the, theos, God. It's it's a a manifestation of something to show the presence of God. Mm-hmm. So we have some of those things happen in the Bible. Um, but again, you're not you're not seeing God at that point, right? And then I would I would finish by just coming back around to um, one of the beautiful things about about our Christian faith is that God did incarnate, did come amongst. I know that's that's another right. podcast you're doing is looking at the incarnation, but God chose to incarnate and God came among us so that when we see Jesus, we see the 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 fullness of God, right? And so we do get a get a glimpse we get a picture and and, and i and i believe that jesus the father the son holy spirit the son even as the athanasian creed says is fully god right um and so i i think with between all those things it's it's not illogical right if somebody says, well you can't see god god's not real i go yeah but there's lots of things i can't see that i i, I have no question are absolutely yep. real and I see the work of God, the hand of God, the manifestation of God in so many different things, the provision of God, mm-hmm. the grace of God that to me, and, and I actually said to my brother, Jason, before he became a Christian, um, I actually said to him, Jason, you need to know that God is more real to me than you are. Right. I lived in Michigan at the time and he was visiting me and I'd always told, always told him, I'll, I'll fly out to Michigan and pay your way if you, while you're here, if you want to talk about Jesus, because he was an atheist at the time. Yep. And uh, and so we had a great conversation. And I said, when he was leaving, I was I was just getting ready to take him to the airport. And I said, Jason, I said, you need to know, um, God is more real to me than you are. So you're going to get on a plane. You're going to fly away. I said, I will question your existence before I question the existence of God. Yeah, that's how really is to me. And so 
if, if I think when there's that relationship and when you walk with Christ, you have that level of conviction and it grows right. with time and it matures with time like everything does. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's an, um, again, a lot of these, a lot of these questions, a lot of these, you know, maybe things you've heard from people who don't believe these gotcha questions. Yeah. They're the, the oversimplicity, it sounds on the surface like it's a good point, but, but mm-hmm. upon reflection, I, I th- even you mentioned like the love between my wife and I, mm-hmm. um, sometimes I wish yeah. it was a thing I could yeah. just hold, right? <laughs> sometimes I wish it was that simple, but reflecting like, is that really what I want it to be? Yeah. yeah. Is, is, is there, could there possibly be a reason yeah. that God is presenting himself to us in the way he yeah. is? Could there possibly be value yeah. to the, the, uh, our pursuit of him and yeah. the way that grows us yeah. and changes us yeah. rather than I, a lot of people will think of God, like, well, why isn't he just up there? I mean, imagine how bland people would yeah. be if it was yeah. that simple. The, yeah. There's no pursuit. Yep. There's just, it's just laid out in front of us, handed to us. Um, upon reflection, that actually is a more powerful mm-hmm. perception of yeah. God, a God yeah. that is leading us somewhere. Yeah. And his very existence is part of that journey. Yeah. That's been, a, that was a powerful revelation hmm. to me when I uh, uh, kind of dwelled on that a yeah. little bit more. Um, as, as you were sharing that, Thomas, I thought of, uh, and, I, and I've read a lot of C.S. Lewis. I love, C.S. Lewis is a, just a, a great thinker from Chronicles, Chronicles mm-hmm. of Narnia to the to a space trilogy, which is oh, fascinating. That's my favorite one. To, uh, and, and it goes on and on and on. And yep. uh, um, The Great Divorce, which is not about marriage, but it's about heaven mm-hmm. and hell. And uh, But... Uh, the, in the in the last battle, which is the final, in, no matter what order you put the uh, the Chronicles of Narnia in, it's yep. always the last battle is always the last one. Yep. And there's some people have ordered them differently in the book sets that they put out. But uh, in the last battle is this picture of of all these different characters that are part of the Chronicles of Narnia that have come to heaven to Narnia, mm-hmm. and they're going further on and higher up, and they're and they're climbing this mountain, and there's this joy and delight and beauty, and the visuals are powerful, and and they they talk about it's like a Narnia within a Narnia within it just gets better and better and more and yeah. more wonderful. Our minds can't comprehend that, but I love Lewis's picture of that. That it's this adventure, this 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 pursuit. Yep. His picture of heaven isn't sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Sounds or, so boring. or singing the same song over and over again forever. Yeah, I think for most people, if they were honest, they'd just say, you know, I mean, like when I hear a new song that I really like, I'll, I'll play. It. I mean, some people get yeah. you'll play it a lot of times, and then after a while, it kind of becomes background. And after a while, it's like I need something different. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and so, but but the idea of this of community and pursuit of God and seeking Him, and the way that Lewis lays it out in the last battle, it's this adventure that goes on forever and ever and ever and gets better and better than you can imagine now to yeah. me that's compelling and interesting yeah more than sitting around and playing i've you know i'm not i don't listen to a lot of harp music it's not something i keep <laughs> loaded into my again my phone you're missing out iPad. man kites and harp man you're that's good you're missing out <laughs> just as a side note did yeah. you ever watch jiminy glick any of the jimmy jiminy glick shows yes yes <laughs> Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's in the forefront of my memory, but I, I have a, seen those. A, a, Mar- a Martin Short, uh, Martin Short, uh, SNL, dressed, right? Dressed up like a like a, a really big guy who interviews people, and it was okay. a shtick he did for years and years and years, and interviews Hollywood stars, yep. and is absolutely brutal on him. But he has his own, had his own talk show for a while. Okay, and the um, the band was led by a harpist. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's worth it's it's worth watching. Um, it it can be uh, not really too crude or raw, but it's 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 not you know but it, but funny <laughs> beware. and uh, and and uh, but but the uh, you know even there with a professional harpist playing yeah. and I don't think the guy was actually playing the harp. Um, it uh, it it's still not compelling to me. There's, no, there's so so the idea of an adventure getting greater and greater yeah. as time goes on, and each step in becomes more real and solid yeah. and glorious. Uh, pursuing, uh, you know, Aslan, the great lion. Yeah. That, that to me is much, you know, as in the picture of Jesus, much more compelling. So, Same, yeah, yeah. Speaking yeah. of C.S. Lewis, uh, one of the kind of more powerful things that he said that st- stands out to me is that, um, and again, I'm not going to quote very well either, but he, he talks about how we're all becoming. Mm-hmm. We're in the process of becoming. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't fill in that gap. We're just becoming, mm-hmm. right? As we grow closer to God and pursue him, we're becoming. And, and, and yeah, that sounds, that sounds, exciting to me that sounds mm-hmm. worth pursuing i somebody once told me that heaven was going to be one eternal worship song and i was a kid at the time and i was i was just devastated yeah 
how yeah. boring that sounded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. I'm glad that my understanding has evolved since yeah. then. Yeah. Um, and it really has been an exciting journey. It, it stimulates the mind. Yeah. But yeah. Um, speaking of all this, I mean, we're talking about our journey yeah. and, and this is exciting for us. Uh, in general, um, why is God worthy? What, may, what is it about mm -hmm. God? We've talked about him. He seems great. But yeah. like, why is he worthy of devoting our lives to? As Christians, yeah. God isn't just this entity. He isn't just this academic mm -hmm. thing in our head mm -hmm. that is really powerful yeah. and that we, uh, we try to make happy, right? Yeah. Why is he worth devoting our lives to? Yeah. And that theme carries through the scriptures. You go all the way back to, we looked earlier, you talked earlier about Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Hear, mm -hmm. O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and love the Lord your God with all that you are. Right. Heart, soul, mind. And then Jesus, when he's asked what's the greatest of all the commandments in all of the Old Testament, he comes right back to that one. And it kind of expounds on it a little bit. And so that's the call. I mean, if some if somebody says, I'm going to be, a follower of Jesus. I'm going to be a, a Christian. You know, Jesus, Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, just, you know, just deny yourself every day, take up your cross, be ready to die. Mm -hmm. And then walk in my footsteps. Yeah. You go, Oh, that's that, that's devotion. You, 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 he better be worthy to follow because he's yeah. saying, follow me with all that you have and all that you are. So I would say, um, again, I, I often think across both the divine and the human, uh, kind of experience at the same time, because I live in the physical, tangible world, and I, I'm only, you know, my understanding of the spiritual realm often is reliant on my understanding of the physical realm because that's the, where I live and what I understand yeah. best. And so I look and say, um, you know, why, why would be a why would a person uh, be worth being devoted to? Right. Um, if if their character and their integrity and the qualities of who they are are noble and good and beautiful and right, and hopefully when a person gets married or builds a friendship or builds a relationship, they Part of what's driving that is this is a person who I respect, who I think is um, worthy of my time, my my friendship. I, I'm the kind of person that I'm fiercely devoted. If I'm devoted to somebody, I'm fiercely devoted to them, to my friends, to my wife, to my children. Um, I try to use wisdom and discernment in that process and, and not be right. unreasonably devoted. But, um, but when it comes to a person, are there qualities and characteristics that make them worthy of being respected, worthy, worthy of your devotion as a person to another person? And, and so then you look at who God is. And if we believe what the Bible teaches and if we believe what we experience when we walk with him, um, this God who is loving and glorious and powerful, who is creator of all, um, who is the I am, who is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. We're, we're going through the series of names of for God in our nights right. of worship as a congregation. So, I mean, the, the first the first three months have really taken me into that place of reflecting on the names of God, and which are, is really about the character of God and the nature yep. of God. And so I would say if, if you study the Bible and you see the characteristics and qualities of God, who he is, um, that's worthy of devotion. Yeah. If, you know, if even if you're being hypothetical, say, well, if such a being existed, if somebody was agnostic or atheistic, so well, if such a being existed, would that God be worthy of praise, devotion, of being honored? Mm -hmm. I think most people would go, yeah, I don't believe or know if that God exists or believe, but if they did, yeah. Right. Um, well, that's what we believe as Christians is yeah. that God does exist and that th that is his nature. I would add to that um, what God does, that he is creator, but also as a follower of Jesus, I believe that he is the provider for me, that he leads me. Um, I believe that he brought the woman I love into my life. It happened in a very odd way that shouldn't have, you know, I was, she was from Michigan. I'm from California. Uh, she grew up in the, in the church. I grew up in a non-believing home. In every possible way, I like things as spicy as you can make them. If she has, if, <laughs> if ketchup has black pepper in it, she, it burns her lips. You know I mean? You could have yeah. to listen. We're so different. And then she shows up in California to work at a camp. I happen to be working at a church and I'm taking a group of kids up to this camp. And you just go, how does all the, I look at that and go, God's hand was in that. I believe yeah. that. Um, and so I look at the things that God has done from over all time. I look at the things that God has done in my life. I look at the things that God is doing even now mm -hmm. uh, in, in a in a challenging time where you know we're recording this podcast at the hoping and praying, moving out of the 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 worst of the COVID experience right. globally. Um, 
a difficult time on many, many levels, both the yep. medical level, interpersonal level, wearing crazy masks level, um, uh, political tension level. I mean, it, you, you name it, there's been tension. So, so, but I look and say, I felt the presence of this God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this, this transcendent but very present God carry me and give me wisdom to walk through probably one of the toughest years. I, I hope the toughest year of my life. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe something ahead that's tougher. But, and I feel the presence of God leading me through that. And so yeah. I think the characteristics and being of who God is, I think that the things that God has done for all people in his creation and his goodness to all people, and then the things that God does day by day that I see his presence, see him work. I go, that those things make make God worthy of my devotion. Yep. Um, and and then and the thing is, and I, I would even say this, even the fact that God is not a God who demands or forces us to be devoted to him. Mm -hmm. He invites our devotion. Right. He he says he you know God doesn't um as as many um political and you know probably kings and queens through history have said you bow the knee to me. Right. And they're just human beings. Yeah. Even even the, even the emperors in, in early Rome who believed that they were gods. I don't I don't think actually most of them believed they were gods, but they were treated as if they were Population gods. Population control, was, yeah. Yeah. But I think that they knew they were going to die because they had watched their father, who was a god, die yep. uh, or get killed <laughs> or poisoned or whatever. And so, but, but you know, all through history, people, you know, there's been people in power who force others to bow the knee to them. Mm -hmm. If this loving, just, glorious God who is eternal and all powerful doesn't do that, yeah. but says, I invite you to come to me. Yep. I invite you, and and many uh, many you know quote false you know, many false gods, people things that uh, beings that people would attribute. Oh, this I believe in this god, this god. Many of those gods, even going even going to like the pantheon of gods of the, of the Greek and Roman uh, mm -hmm. pantheons, these are capricious, power hungry, um, domineering, you know, personalities. Right. They weren't real beings, but just you know, but but the God of the Bible um, in this life says, I invite you to come to me. Right, and that and that really is consistent with the Old and the New Testament. What shocks me about the Bible is its honesty, and and its raw um, storytelling of people who are so broken and so messed up that God, even God's best people in the Bible, were clearly people. Right. If 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 somebody was trying to make you know somebody was inventing a sacred book to try to make these characters seem um, noble, they did a really bad job because it really because <laughs> because because almost every single character, um, every single person. I'm using character as in their characteristics, not right. as if they don't exist. I believe they were real people. But man, it's a raw, honest telling of what their lives were like. And and if it's a summary of their lives, which most, it always is, it tends to be a summary of a lot of their worst moments, not their best. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that that the Bible presents God to us in a way that, that invites us to come to him, to bow our knee, to yield to him, but that God doesn't force us. Even like the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road where he's, you know, knocked off the donkey, he's knocked to the ground, and God speaks to him. Mm -hmm. That's as stark a calling as you can get. Right. But there's not a sense that God is forcing him to believe. There's a sense that God is waking him up to something yeah. and gives him an opportunity to believe, and then he chooses to surrender. Right. And, and there's that, the, you know, yeah, there's this, seems to be, through the conversation, there's the awareness of God's power mm -hmm. and majesty, but his also his care and and like a a, a, a closer view there's a well-roundedness to this, mm -hmm. um, and it's a powerful thing because I, it, we're, there's not all faiths, and, and again, that we don't just believe this because it's the nicest sounding God. Mm -hmm. There's other reasons that we yeah. believe these things, but uh, but it really is the nicest sounding God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's uh, this is a God I want to believe in. Yeah. It's, it's not a God yeah. I feel. Um, there's not, uh, you know, uh, some religions, there's a lot of duty that maybe it's yeah. cultural, maybe it's yeah. your, your parents. There's a lot of duty that you have to believe this. and But this really is a God, and, and there's some misconceptions that maybe our God is kind of that. Like yeah. there is some uh, uh, some things in the Old Testament that a lot of people have questions about. But a real deep understanding really is this is a God that's not only powerful and majestic and holy, but yeah. intimate and compassionate and yeah. loving. Yeah. Um, where do we get that theology from? Where do we get all these ideas from? Um, well, it you know, b b you know, Orthodox Christian theology it has to be rooted in Scripture, yep. and so you've got you've got the 66, 66 books of the Bible, yep, and uh, which are are this amazing 
compilation, and 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 I believe, and the church believes, um, led by the you know guided by the Spirit of God through a process of inspiring people across centuries mm-hmm. from different walks of life, from different. I mean, I mean the the breadth of the different people that God inspired to write the words of Scripture, the process itself, um, the canonization process, process of saying what is Holy Scripture, all of that. I believe that the Spirit of God was superintending over that through yeah. people. But every book of the Bible, there, there, you know, some people have this idea that, that sort of the, the prophets and the writers of the Bible just sort of had, sort of sat at a table with a, a parchment and a quill and their eyes rolled back white and they just, <laughs> you know, just started writing. And yeah. it's like, no, that's not, that's not the way the Bible reveals itself. That there's personality, there's historical setting. They're writing with a purpose and a reason to specific people in a certain context mm-hmm. historically. To me, that's much more compelling than the idea right. of of somebody finding this buried sacred book and saying, "Here yeah. it is." It's more secret. believable too. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. It, it comes out of, and you go. You you know the context where it came from. Came from you know the people that it was speaking to. You. It talks about the city, and there are some cities in the Bible mentioned that people say, "Well, we know the Bible's not true because this city doesn't even exist." Mm-hmm. And time and time and time again through history over the last hundred years, those cities have been found. Right. And, and to the point where a lot of archaeologists start have you know started using the Bible as the way to go find things versus trying to say the Bible's messed up. They're saying, oh no, we're because if the Bible says it, we're going to go. And then they start they use that they kind of triangulate from the locations and start doing a dig, and all of a sudden, ah, here there it is. is. Yeah. And so. Um, yeah, so so I think that you know we, we our theology is should be framed by the Bible, should be led by the Bible, and if somebody says I have this theological disposition or worldview, mm-hmm. and it's antithetical to what the Bible teaches, mm-hmm. then then it's it's going to be errant theology. It's it's not solid biblical theology, and so that's that's the starting point. And then you also have you can add to that a layer of brilliant minds and faithful um, thinkers and people who lived out their faith now through the last 20 centuries right who have helped to shape and think that through whether whether it's it's uh, pe- people like Calvin and Luther and Zwingli the the, Refo- the reformed kind of great reformed thinkers and theologians mm-hmm. um, whether it's I mean so all through the history you can think different streams of theology and at the end of the day do, do all the theological minds through history agree with each other no I mean there there, there were some massive uh, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll call them quibbles or quarrels um <laughs> That's a nice um, it. but but I mean you know there were there was just you know there were real battles over that mm-hmm. um and so I think we also can lean into learning from great minds who have gone before us and yep. I think also our theology should be affirmed and and somewhat shaped by our experience with God but I say that but being very careful yeah because uh, my, you know, some people will say, "Well, this has been my experience, therefore the Bible's wrong." Mm-hmm. Now you're always going back to the Bible as the final authority. But what happens for 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 almost any follower of Jesus over time is they they learn what the Bible teaches as they begin to you know, the Bible teaches that God is loving and compassionate. Then they walk through a really difficult time and they feel the compassion and love of God, and it reaffirms what the Bible teaches. Right. So I would say Scripture uh, first and primarily. Uh, the 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 stream of theology through the through the centuries, yep. uh, being wise that these are human beings who are limited. In the same way that we were talking earlier about the creeds were written by groups of Christians who came mm-hmm. together, and and tried to clarify with their own words, uh, in fewer words, a big picture of what the Bible is teaching. Right. right. Um, so so that there's the help of those theological minds yep. and, and the stream of the church, and then there's our own experience that I would say let your experience affirm what the Bible teaches and what the church has taught through time. Mm-hmm. But if your own personal experience is absolutely antithetical to what the Bible teaches, um, great example in my own life, when my wife and I were dating and engaged, um, I knew the Bible was very clear about moral and sexual boundaries mm-hmm. outside of marriage. And a lot of people go, at, I know that's true, I know the Bible teaches it, but I'm not gonna even follow it. I, I actually plan on being a pastor and Sharon and I made a decision that we were gonna follow the biblical guidelines mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and and stopping points yep. um, and all the complexity of what what's involved in that, right? But there were times where in my own heart and mind, I would do the, we're gonna be married in just two months. What does a piece of paper make? How does that yep. make a difference? How does standing in front of a pastor in a church really make a difference? And there there was temptations and whisperings in my coming. And I'm not even gonna say the devil put it on me. Just my own w- w- sinful mm-hmm. um, heart and De, you know, desire for this woman who I loved and wanted to spend the rest of my life with, right? And so I, I could look and go, okay, I could have rationalized in my own heart and mind. Yeah. And so I, I could say, well, okay, God's word is wrong because it doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. I, 
I've spent a lifetime really trying not to do that. Are there times I stumble into that and I have to look back and go, you know what? I just did a stupid rationalization, whether it's an outburst of frustration towards someone or not being gracious and kind or whatever it is. Right. God's grace is sufficient. Uh, this this isn't a podcast about my personal sins and, and failings and frailties. <laughs> we'll have one of those. But, but, but that, that, yeah. that'd be fun too. <laughs> yeah. you know, let, let's have Pastor Sean do that one. Perfect. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but our, our experiences as we walk with God aren't meant to say God's wrong because I think this. They're meant to, they, they reaffirm what the scriptures teach and yep. what we believe. Yep. And so our experiences can be helpful in that way. Yeah. And we'll do yep. the Bible's one of the big yep. topics we'll do yep. coming up and, and mm-hmm. exactly. Um, again, this isn't really apologetic. There's a whole other thing on yeah. the reliability of Scripture, what the Scripture is itself. But w- but uh, we'll dive into the, the exactly what we take from the Bible. What, what, what is, it is this for book? Us. What is this yeah. book, and what does it do, and how should it change our lives? And, exactly. And, and, and Thomas, I want to say I love the fact that, and I think you've been the driving force behind this new podcast, which I thank you for. Um, it's one thing to to enter into kind of polemical argumentative debate format to try to prove something. It's mm-hmm. another as Christians to say, this is what we believe and this is why we believe it and why we hold to it with all of our hearts. So yeah. I think this, this pod series of podcasts is going to be about that, which I think is a really a gift to the church. So, yeah. 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 I'm really excited about it. Yeah. And uh, it, I, I'm trying to hold back digging in deeper because yeah. you, you mentioned the Bible and that's where we get our theology from God yeah. in and it. And I just want to start diving right into yeah. the, the Bible. But um, uh, that's a great place to stop. It transitions into our uh, uh, our future episodes. And yeah. um, there was another thing we were going to talk about, misconceptions about God. But uh, now that we're... Uh, I don't think there's really... I don't this, think there's any... Yeah, any yeah. There's not any... That's not a that's Exactly. Not a everybody, yeah. everybody knows it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, maybe we do a whole episode, I think. I think yeah. as Because yeah. there's going to be misconceptions about a lot of these. We're going to talk about the incarnation, yeah. the resurrection, yeah. the church, uh, the yeah. Bible, sanctification. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can just go on and on. We'll we'll yeah. keep doing these as uh, as you know yeah. needed, I guess. Um, well, it, it'd be fun to talk about miscon do do something that's maybe two or three parts, but you know, misconceptions that um, that non believers have yep. about God, misconceptions that the world, the kind of the world system seems to perceive things, yep. and then misconceptions that Christians have. Yeah, and that can be a real interesting kind of a three part podcast yep. to do. So, and that's one of the yeah, yeah. I, and I hope people find this useful even as Christians. Yeah. Um, I know myself uh in, in my journey i've looked back and i said man where did i get that yeah. i've believed this for so many years like yeah. where did i get that from yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you realize oh this is just some thing that's that's followed my, my, my wacky yeah. aunt or yeah. my, you know where did yeah exactly yeah. so so yeah. hopefully this is useful yeah. and uh we'll get into a lot more of that but thank you kevin and uh right. we're, we're yeah. excited to, to keep going yeah. on this and yeah. and next podcast is the incarnation so we'll talk about I that next that, time I'm, I'm looking forward to that one i, I will uh we'll have a great conversation thank you Thomas. indeed all right yeah. see you next time thank you Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation about God. Next week, we'll be talking about the incarnation. Make sure to uh, tune in, whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app. Subscribe to make sure you don't miss an episode. And uh, a quick little plug. uh, Not all of our listeners are from Shoreline Church, but uh, this podcast is sort of birthed out of Shoreline Church, and so we have a lot of our listeners uh, from the church here in Monterey, California. And uh, this little announcement is for you. It's about our Easter services coming up. I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware. Uh, Our Good Friday services on April 2nd will be 12 o'clock p.m. and 7 o'clock p.m., and Easter Sunday, April 4th, we'll be having an 8.30, uh, 8.30, sorry, 10 o'clock and 11.30 a.m. And we're at the tail end of COVID here, so we're still doing the outdoor services or a live stream. Those are the two options. If you would like to attend in person in our outdoor services, then make sure you register online at shoreline.church. Otherwise, join us online, join the live stream, uh, pass the link on to your families. You can access the live stream on our website, shoreline.church, our YouTube channel, uh, uh, Facebook. Yeah, we live stream to all, all of them. So however you, you get to us, we hope that you are there. And uh, we're really excited to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening to uh, our first episode of this series, uh, the first of many we're really excited about. And we'll see you next week for The Incarnation.